Okay, welcome to CS155. The um, Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, apparently there is a uh, two different projection systems on this, in this room now. Uh, first time doing that for me. Um, this projector seems to be a little bit muted in the color, so I apologize for that. I'll try to figure out how to use the, uh, the new TV system for the next lecture if possible. But um, okay, welcome to CS155, cross-listed with CMS, CNS, and EEE. Uh, this is machine learning and data mining. Um, raise of hands, who here are undergrads? And who here are graduate students? Okay, so about 50-50, great. So uh, today we'll just be talking about uh, some of the basics of machine learning, but first we'll talk a little bit about uh, administrivia. Um, so course info. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m. So you all know that because you're here right now at the Beckman Institute Auditorium, which is this room. Uh, we have recitations uh, as needed. Uh, they will be on Thursdays in the evenings. Uh, the location will be confirmed and I'll, soon, and I'll send out the information uh, as soon as that location is confirmed. And the recitations uh, are basically... Um, a little bit deeper dive into topics that maybe some of you may not have as much uh, experience with. So for example, if you're a PhD student uh, in, let's say, biology, and you're not as experienced using Python as you know, someone who has been studying computer science for several years, we have a recitation this Thursday on Introduction to Python. Uh, the recitation usually lasts about 45 to 60 minutes. Um, of course, they can't go longer if people have a lot of questions. Uh, the staff, my name is Yi Song Yu, I'm the instructor of this course. We have a great uh, team of uh, TAs uh, for this class, uh, 14 in all. And they'll be the ones who will be uh, managing the homeworks, um, any questions or hopefully not too many complaints about the assignments, holding office hours for the assignments and uh, that aspect of the course in general. And Matt Levine uh, on the top left is the head TA. Okay, the course breakdown. Um, there, basically, there's 10 things. Each one is worth 10% of the grade. Um, six homeworks, each, uh, in total worth 60%. And um, that is a typo, I'll fix that. It's due Wednesday night on Gradescope. And three mini projects, each worth, uh, in total worth 30% of the final grade. And a final exam worth 10% of the final grade. Uh, some of you may have heard rumors about the final being a little bit different last year compared to previous years. Uh, for those of you who have heard such rumors, please be assured that whatever happened last year on the final will not happen again. <laughs> and so it'll be in the same format as it was two years ago. Oh yeah, by the way, one more thing. Um, many of you are also taking this class concurrently with CS144 and CS139. Uh, for those of you who are, just please be aware of the exact due dates of when the homeworks are due, uh, because the, especially with CS144, we have a similar cadence in terms of homework assignments and mini projects. Uh, regarding homework one, so this class is uh, uh, caters to a very broad uh, set of students. Some have uh, with varying, uh, various uh, backgrounds and different levels of expertise in different areas. And so for undergrads, um, my expectation is that you have taken CS156. That's my primary expectation. Um, and so homework one is sort of a, a um, which will be released tomorrow, will be a, uh, a checkpoint for you. Um, if you've taken CS156 and did well in it, homework one should be pretty straightforward. Um, if you did not take CS156, um, it might take a bit longer. Um, if you are able to get through homework one, you will, for the most part, have mostly caught up with the class. Uh, of course, because this class does cater to such a broad audience, you know, if you find yourself uh, struggling a little bit with uh, homework one, maybe um, we can have a conversation, think about the prerequisites, maybe um, you know, consider uh, taking some more of the prerequisites, uh, which are all soft prerequisites. Um, except for CS156, and then maybe taking the class in a future time. But this is just to, so, so that you can help calibrate yourself. For PhD students, um, go for it. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Okay, if there's a late submission policy, um, up to 48 free hours in increments of one hour each. So if you submit a homework, it's, you know, it's, let's say it's due next Wednesday at 9 p.m. Um, and you submit it at 9.15 p.m., that you've used up one hour of late homework uh, availabil availability credits. And uh, you, know, we will, you, you should specify uh, the number of late hours used when submitting. We will also keep track of that on Gradescope, and we keep, uh, keep account of that. Um, course etiquette. Um, I welcome questions during lecture. I think it's a great way to uh, keep the course interactive. If you have questions, it probably means uh, several other people uh, either uh, here or watching it. The lectures online will have similar questions and I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if it's too much of a disruption to the flow of the lecture, I may defer it uh, in the interest of time, but by and large, I welcome uh, questions during lecture. If you arrive late, if you need to leave early, I totally get it. Um, just please do so quietly. Um, we have an updated collaboration policy. So uh, the CS department, um, we created a new collaboration policy rubric uh, last year. And um, it's been slightly tweaked this year compared to last year. And CS 155 has adopted this uh, collaboration policy rubric. You can find it on the, um, you can find it on the course website. Uh, the basic idea is um, uh, for homeworks, you can you know, talk, talk to each other. For mini projects, you work in groups. Um, if you're talk, if for the homeworks, if you are uh, um, collaborating, that's totally fine. But in terms of copying, uh, copying answers from each other, that's not allowed. Observe the 50-foot rule. And for mini projects, you work in a team anyways. And for the final exam, no collaboration whatsoever. That's, that's the gist of it. OK. Okay, course website. Um, you can find it on my website. My website is pretty easy to find, www.yisongyu.com. Uh, it's easy to navigate. You can find the, the course. Um, has up-to-date office hours, lecture notes, additional reading, homeworks, and everything else you need for the class. There are two main ways in which you interact with the TAs in the class. Uh, they are Gradescope and Piazza, uh, outside of office hours, of course. Um, of course, there's FaceTime with, off, during office hours. But uh, in, in terms of uh, virtual interactions, there are two ways, uh, Gradescope and Piazza. Uh, Gradescope is for managing assignments. Um, we'll also post solutions and grades on there. And Piazza is for course announcements and uh, Q&A forums. So please use the Q&A forum if you have questions about homeworks or anything about the class. The TAs are going to be very active on the forums. We'll also have all the lecture videos available online as well. Any questions about administra administrative stuff? OK, so let's get on with the class. Um, so machine learning and data mining. What is machine learning and data mining? So um, it's the process of converting data and experience into knowledge. So data are things that we're all now very experienced with, everything you think of. Uh, you know has a, a data element to it these days. Uh, knowledge is a computer model. Um, and the process is an algorithm. So that's the nuts and bolts of what machine learning and data mining are. Um, this class will touch on both aspects of machine learning and data mining. Uh, machine learning, uh, and to a large extent, they, they're you know, more or less using the same set of tools. And so in terms of the nuts and bolts, uh, there's a huge overlap. You'll be learning sort of all of it. Uh, in terms of the basics. Uh, uh, but you know, when we think about sort of what these methods are used in service of in terms of hi uh, higher order activities, you know, machine learning focuses more on the algorithms, so typically a bit more mathematically rigorous. Uh, data mining focuses more on sort of the, the knowledge you can extract uh, from, this, um, from this data set. These days, data mining is also more popularly known as data science. So perhaps we should update the um, name of the class, but that's a paperwork nightmare, so I choose not to. But you can think of data mining as data science. Um, typically uses the machine learning algorithms, and the knowledge that it's extracted should be, in some sense, human understandable. But again, in terms of the nuts and bolts and the tools used, a uh, very large overlap. OK, so here's the course outline. Um, we're going to spend five weeks on supervised learning. 
which will be the bulk of what you get out of this class in terms of uh, practical stuff. Uh, supervised learning is the most popular paradigm used in industry today, and also the, one of the most popular and most successful paradigms used uh, in very, various domains across the sciences as well. We'll also spend about two weeks on unsupervised learning, um, which um, is also very, quite popular um, in many scientific domains where you don't necessarily have a supervised label. And we'll conclude with two weeks on probabilistic modeling, where uh, we think about probabilities and, gener and generative models and how to reason about you know, uncertainty. So uh, let's start with supervised learning. So uh, in a nutshell, supervised learning is about finding a function, also known as a mapping or a predictor or a hypothesis, that maps from some input space x to an output space y. And we, we often use two letters to denote this mapping. One is F and the other one is H. I'll use them fairly interchangeably um, in this class, although sometimes one will be, have a specific meaning. But you can think of both F and H as you see them, as you see these things in the literature, whether it's on Wikipedia or some research paper you're reading, uh, they often refer to the predictor or the hypothesis or the mapping as F or H. And the goal is to learn such a predictor such that prediction error is low on a pre-collected training set where we have these labels Y. So examples include fake news detection, where if X is a piece of news and Y is a label, is this fake news, yes or no? Then given such a pre-collected training set of XY pairs, the goal is to find an F or an H that can accurately predict the corresponding Y when given an input X. Another example is if X was some set of DNA sequences and Y was uh, uh, an indicator of whether or not this DNA sequence encoded a specific function or is of a specific category, yes or no, then given this uh, a pre-collected training set of such XY pairs, find a F that has a low error on the pre-collected training set that when it tries to map X to Y. The final example is if X is a molecular compound and we want to predict, let's say, a real value property rather than a categorical property, let's say the, the thermal stability of this particular compound, then again, we want to find an F that has low error uh, in terms of this mapping on a pre-collected data set of XY pairs. So that's supervised learning in a nutshell. Um, and so you get this data set, X, the, the raw data, if you will. You have some target signal Y that you have access to. In this case, let's say the X is movies on Amazon, and the Y is the average rating of these movies on Amazon. And so now given some attributes of a movie, we want to be able to predict uh, the average rating. That's the, that's the learning problem, the supervised learning problem. We feed the XY pairs into a machine, and you know, we run a machine learning algorithm and it spits out an F such that for this set of XY pairs, the, uh, the F basically, uh, hopefully is very accurate and it, it, it predicts the more or less correct Y for any X in the training set. That's the hope. And there are many ways to do these. Um, you know, there are many methods. Deep learning or artificial neural nets are very popular these days. More, more uh, conventional methods or classical methods such as logistic regression remain very popular. And there are other methods as well. And we will cover each and every one of these methods throughout this class. Uh, and you could think of these as what's called a function class or a hypothesis class of functions or predictors. This is just the terminology that we use in machine learning or the space of functions that we're learning over. OK, so as an aside, so for unsupervised learning, which will cover a little bit uh, about halfway through this class. Um, there is no supervised target. We only have the raw data. And so the goal, rather than to find a prediction target that, is, uh, that we can learn to map to accurately, the goal is a little bit different. Uh, it's some notion of finding a low dimensional summary or reconstruction of the data set to find a low dimensional pattern that explains the variability of the data. And we'll get to you know, many examples uh, later on in this course. Any questions so far? OK, so let's 
dive into an example, one of my favorite examples, um, spam filtering. So the goal is to write a program to filter spam. You know, this is a very important problem. If you ever looked at the spam folder of your email, um, you'll, you'll realize why this is a very important problem. It's also a very hard problem. So to, to sort of think about why it's hard, let's go through a, a few examples in a thought experiment. So imagine we had this email, and that's the subject of the email. Uh, raise of hands, how many of you think it's spam? Raise of hands, how many think it's not spam? Okay, good. So we're all in agreement that this email is spam. I also think it's spam. Next email. Raise of hands if you raise your hand if you think this email is spam. Uh huh. You, I don't think any of you will pass this class. Raise your hand if you think it's not spam. Good. Okay. I also think it's not spam. Final example. Raise your hand if you think this email is spam. And raise your hand if you think it's not spam. I fear for your bank account. <laughs> I think it's spam. Okay. Now let's write a program to actually filter these emails. If you just took CS1 and you learn how to program in Python, you might, your first instinct might be to write something like this, right? So um, my first instinct, to, uh, you know, as a freshman who just took CS1, might be, might be to write something like this. There are a lot of problems with this as a spam filtering uh, program. One is it is extremely brittle. If things don't match um, perfectly in the if then else statements, then it'll get through the spam filter. If, um, if I come up with a new case of something that uh, should be filtered, um, I need to add another line to the if then else statement. And so these are just two examples of why this process is very brittle and hard to do manually. Um, so why is spam filtering hard? Just to summarize. It's somehow easy for a human to recognize, but it's hard for humans to write down a prescriptive algorithm. Right? So if you were to do that, it would be a lot of if then else statements with some backtracking, with partial matching of words, and all that stuff. So it's really hard to write down an algorithm, but in some sense, it's easy to, to recognize. There's, there's, some, there's some notion of a label that we can provide quite easily, much more easily than we, can, than we can sort of write down an algorithm for, or a program for, explicitly. And so these are one class of problems, one of the biggest class of problems where machine learning has a lot of leverage and has a lot of value. And so the, it's not the only class of problems, but we'll, we'll focus on it for this lecture. Um, so let's think about how to use machine learning to solve this problem. So again, we're going to do supervised learning. So we'll have a training set of emails and a label of spam or not spam. And we'll assume that um, it's relatively easy for humans to provide this label, certainly much easier than actually writing the program in this particular example. Um, and so this is our supervised labels the training set. So the, the, the emails are the raw data, the X, and the spam or not spam labels are the binary labels or the supervised labels Y. Step one, we need to build a representation of the raw data. Step two, we run a learning algorithm on this supervised training set with this representation of the data. And from that comes a classification model that can classify, given this representation of the raw data, whether or not this email is spam or not spam. Okay, so there are many ways to build a representation of the, of, the, uh, of the raw data. We'll go through several in this class, but for the purposes of keeping it simple in this lecture, lecture one, let's just use what's called a bag of words representation. So a bag of words representation is constructed as follows. It gets more complicated, but this is sort of the, one of the simplest versions, arguably the simplest version of a bag of words representation, which is arguably the simplest representation of, of text. And so let's assume that we have a vocabulary of words that we care about. For the sake of this example, let's assume that that vocabulary is size six. So a bag of words representation is a vector of values, in this case, binary values, where if the word uh, corresponding to the entry of that vector appears in this email, we'll put a value of one in that, vec in that entry, and otherwise put a value of zero. So ap appearance or, uh, or, or not appearing in the email. So obviously it can get much more complicated, it can count, it can do other things, but let's just stick with this as, uh, as the example. This is also known as a feature vector in machine learning terminology, so you'll hear that come up a lot if you listen to machine learning talks or read machine learning papers, a feature vector. This is a feature vector, this is a featureization of the email. Um, in practice, of course, 
you know, we can have tens of thousands or millions of words in our vocabulary. We may even have billions of words in our vocabulary. So for example, um, if you want to build a bag of words representation on Twitter, people abbreviate, people misspell, people have hashtags, people, you know, people do all sorts of stuff on Twitter that are uh, results in non-canonical words. And if you want to actually capture all of that, if you did, if you did want to do that, that would lead to a bag of words representation that could be, you know, a billion in length. Next, we need to choose a model class. So, um, for again, for the purposes of keeping it simple to have go through a concrete example in lecture one, let's use linear models. So let x denote the bag of words representation or the bag of words feature vector representation of an email. So for example, for any given email, we basically write it as, uh, let's see, where's my mouse? Right here. We basically write it as this x, which is a vector of binary values of length six in our example. A linear classifier basically takes uh, all the entries of this, um, of this vector and um, does a weighted sum of it and then checks if that sum is greater than the threshold. For those of you familiar with linear algebra, um, this is also known as a dot product. So we have this w. This is a parameter of our linear classifier. And this, this is called a dot product. And if you're not familiar with, as familiar with linear algebra, we'll have a recitation on linear algebra later in this course in, a, in like a week or two. Um, what that basically means is it's a for loop over the entries of this vector where we do this weighted sum. And we check if this weighted sum is greater than some threshold b. That's also a parameter of our linear model class. And if it's greater than this threshold b, then we predict, yes, it's spam. If it's less than this threshold b, then in which case the value is ne inside the sign function is negative, then we predict, no, it's not spam. <coughs> Any questions? In this paradigm, do we assume sign zero is zero? In this paradigm, we, um, so the question is, do we assume sign of zero is zero? Um, in this paradigm, we typically don't assume that the value inside the sign function is, is exactly zero um, when after you've learned a model. Um, for technical reasons, yes, we assume sign of zero is zero. Um, in practice, that basically doesn't happen. It's always, you know, either greater than or less than zero after the model's learned. Okay, so um, this is an example. So uh, here's our supervised training set, our bag of words representation. Our goal is to learn the W and the B from the supervised training set such that, um, the, you know, the output of the sign function is positive on the emails that are labeled spam and negative on the emails that are labeled not spam. That's the basic idea. And that's what a machine learning algorithm will do when given the supervised training set and a specification of a model class, in this case, linear models. And on the top right, uh, for this very simple example, uh, here's the instantiation of W and B that will give you perfect classification, at least on, this fir on the first six examples in the training set. And of course, if you're, you know, if you're curious, you can work out um, the, the math and the, com and the arithmetic yourself um, offline. Okay, so um, you've actually learned a lot about um, you've actually learned a lot about machine learning already. So uh, linear models are actually uh, still, rem they st even in the age of deep learning, linear models remain a workhorse of machine learning. They are used in industry. Uh, I, think I, would, I think they are still the most popular models used in industry right now um, in terms of everyday usage. Um, and you know, if you just have a feature representation, collect a supervised training set, train a linear model, and then you know, if, it, if, it, if the model checks out, you can deploy it and use it in production. So let's talk about some other issues. Um, why might we expect this process to work at all? 
And the reason why we expect this process to work, or I think the best reason, is that there are repeated patterns in the data. And ideally, these patterns are captured in your feature representation of the raw data. So for example, uh, the words Nigerian prince is typically indicative of spam. And so observing those words and, if, and assuming those words are captured in your representation, then you, know, you will learn a pattern from a large training set that these words are indicative of spam. You put a high weight on those words. Your, model will, your learning algorithm will learn to put a high weight on those words. So that's, that's the idea. And so there are two basic supervised learning paradigms. The first one is classification, as we have just saw, where um, in, in the simplest case, it's binary classification, although we can go into multi-class as well. And in binary classification, uh, you basically do this weighted, uh, for a linear model, you do a weighted um, sum of the attributes of the feature vectors. Uh, and then you see if it's above or below a threshold. If it's above, then you predict the positive class. If it's below, you predict the negative class. The other type of supervised learning is called regression, where the goal is to predict a real value rather than a category, and in which case the simplest thing to do is just not have the sign. So we, all we're doing is we're just taking away, excuse me, we're taking away the sign in classification. We just don't have that. We're just literally just returning the raw score of the linear model. And that we use that for for regression. Question? Yes. Yeah. Um, sorry, but going back to the last thing, um, using this approach, like you know, for instance, uh, say I, the word Nigerian does appear separately, this, you know, versus them appearing together, if they're appearing together. Like, um, okay. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, in this specific example, Nigerian prince is a compound word, and the bag of words representations basically destroys the, any notion of compound words. If Nigerian print appears, it, it flags the Nigerian feature value. If prints appears, it flags the prints feature value. And if both appear, they, they flag both. But how do you know if they're appearing in, together in the text? And the way you get around that is to use more expressive feature representations that include compound words in your vocabulary. Um, we will talk about more expressive feature representations later on in this class. But that's a great question. So that, that's an that's a, that's a indication of a weakness of the express, expressiveness of this particular feature representation for this problem. OK. So back to classification and regression. So um, you know, they're actually highly related. As you can see, the, the form of the function classes are, are very similar. And in fact, you can you know, train a model to do regression. So you know, I could treat these labels, these, these, these spam or not spam labels, just as plus one or minus one, positive or negative. And I could just train a regressor to pr try to predict a real value number, and then just take the sign on it afterwards. It may not work as well as training it for classification, but you know, in some sense, it can work pretty well. And we'll see, we'll talk more about the relationship between regression and classification later on. OK. So um, if I took away the sign, if I go back to this example where um, I constructed this W and B uh, model that had perfect classification accuracy on the first six examples, and I take away the sign function, I don't use the sign function, uh, here are the actual raw scores before you take the sign. Any questions? <clears throat> yes? So um, this filter actually wouldn't be a good model for um, regression because uh, if you're doing supervised learning, you don't know um, how much to give to each of the spam or not spam uh, in the beginning because you don't have to jump in the first place, right? Or you, you learn, so, the, so you learn WMB as part of the learning algorithm over the supervised training set. So you're given the supervised training set, you're given this representation, you're given the fact that you're using a linear model class, which basically corresponds to a W and a B, and the learning algorithm learns a W and a B. Here I handpick the W and the B, but the learning algorithm will learn it automatically. For X, you can put in the email 
email, but then for why? It's, oh yeah, it's plus one or minus one. So spam is plus one, not spam is minus one. In this simple example. Okay, so some formal definition. So um, this notation is fairly common in many machine learning uh, papers and textbooks, but it varies a little bit. Um, we have a training set, I'll call it capital S. Um, and it's a, pair of, it's a set of XY pairs where capital N is the size of your training set. And X is assumed to live in a D-dimensional, uh, is, is assumed to be a D-dimensional feature vector. And Y in this case is binary. Um, this notation is fairly common, although you'll see some variations of it. Um, we have a model class, also known as a hypothesis class, in this case linear models. That are param and, and the parameterizations of this linear model class is a W vector and a B scalar. Um, and the goal is to find the parameters of this function class that predicts well on this training set. And so the remaining thing that we need to, we need to talk about is how to quantify well. And that's where we come to loss functions. So that's the next step in the basic supervised learning recipe which is the choice of a loss function. A loss function specifies, uh, uh, one second, a, a loss function specifies uh, the degree of mismatch between the ground truth or the true supervised label, I'll call it the first argument A, and the prediction of your model, I'll call it the second argument B. Question. Is there any loss of generality of assuming that you can represent any input as some number of real numbers? The question is, is there any loss of generality Assuming you can represent any input as a as a as a vector of real numbers, yes, there is loss of generality. So, for example, if um, um, uh, I can just give you an example, I can I can I can represent um, any function using as a linear function. If the basis of that function, if the bases, if the feature values are the Taylor expansion of that function, or something related to the Taylor expansion, for functions with bounded number of derivatives, then it's finite. For functions that have an infinite number of derivatives, then you cannot you you lose representation power for any finite length feature rep, feature vector. Just as, as just as one example. There are others, of course, but. Okay, so this particular example is squared loss, um, where, the, the, where we characterize the mismatch between the, the first argument, the, the, the true supervised label, and the second argument, the predictor of our model, A and B, as quadratically increasing as they differ in disagreement, as they increase in disagreement. And this is a choice you'll have to make to be able to quantify how poorly uh, um, a misprediction is. And then given the choice of a loss function, we now have what's called the learning objective or the learning problem, where we want to find the W and the B, the parameterizations of our linear function class that minimizes the sum or the expected value, if you, if you divide by n, um, of the loss over our training set, where the first argument is the tr true supervised label, and the second argument is the prediction of our function class given that W and B on input X sub I. And the learning algorithm is then going to try to find the minimizer of this optimization problem. Yes? So the loss function being where B in the loss function is the entire W, X minus B. B in the loss function is the output of F. Right. So yeah. Entire. Yep, that's right. Oh, I see, because I used B here in two different uh, contexts. Uh-huh. Okay, so this B has nothing to do with this B. Okay, sorry for that. Okay, so there are many different choices of loss functions that we can use. Um, so for example, for classification, the loss function that people prefer, if they can use, is zero one loss, where it's um, basically um, 
um, you know, uh, do, the, do, do A and B agree on their sign, basically? Yes or no? Depending on what the input format of A and B are. Do they agree on their sign? If so, the loss is zero. If they disagree on their sign, the loss is one. So in the special case where the sign is zero, then you, you still incur a loss of one because they disagree on their sign, and the ground truth is either positive or negative. Uh, we've seen squared loss. Um, and so these are sort of the, the two canonical examples. That the zero one loss is used for classification or is preferred for classification, and squared loss is preferred for regression, typically. And we can plot these out. Right? So um, if the target label was, so if this is assuming uh, x was one dimensional, so x is just a one dimensional feature that, uh, who, a scalar, so it's just a scalar feature val value that takes value that takes uh, attribute value between minus two and positive three, and the target. Or excuse me. Um, backtrack slightly. Uh, let's say uh, I, I confuse myself. Forget what I just said in the last sentence. Uh, this is the output of f. The x-axis is the output of f of x, which is a uh, real value, real scalar value. The target uh, that we want to predict is. One, so the target is a positive label. Um, for if we were treating this as a classification problem, we would take the sign of this scalar value. So at zero, uh, for negative, we will predict negative one, and for positive, we will predict positive one. For regression, we would just take the raw, um, the raw value of the of the of the linear regressor. And so here, I'm just plotting a comparison of the geometry of um, squared loss versus zero one loss. Where for squared loss, you see, obviously you see this quadratic shape where the, as, you de as you deviate from the correct prediction of plus one, the penalty for the misprediction increases super linearly. Uh, for zero one loss, as soon as our predictor predicts a positive value, the loss is zero because we take the sign. We compare the sign of the, of the values. As soon as the function, the predictor, has a value that's negative, we incur a loss of 1. Because again, we're just comparing the sign of the prediction versus the sign of the label. So this is, the look, uh, this is sort of um, uh, a geometry of the, uh, of the problem. Notice also that scale doesn't matter. I can multiply everything by 10 or multiply everything by, by 0.1. Um, it doesn't change the minimizer of this optimization problem. Only the shape differences change the minimizer of this optimization problem. Also note that if I have a, uh, if I were able to learn a W and a B that gets perfect regression error, so perfect squared error, it would also get perfect zero one loss. But the reverse is not true. If I get perfect zero one loss, it doesn't necessarily mean I get perfect squared error. Because I could be predicting you know, something over here or something over here. That's perfect zero one loss, but that's not perfect squared loss. OK, so suppose I wanted to get perfect squared loss on the first six examples of my training set. In which case, I wanted the raw score of the, of the linear model, not the sign of it, but the raw score to be exactly plus one or minus one on these six examples. Well, uh, I, again, I handpicked this, but you know, this is an instantiation of W and B that can achieve perfect, zero, perfect squared loss uh, on the first six examples. Rounded to the uh, second decimal place. <laughs> 